Um, it's, it's, a, it's a minimalist game, and um, for example, there's no score. You can see on, um, on the screen while you play. And as far as I can tell, and I'll, I'll ask Zach, I, I don't think there's a direct connection between the quality of the moves that you make um, and the score that you get. Yeah, that's true, right? It's just how far you progress, right? Um, so basically, there's no enemy here. Um, there's only a sense of dissonance that you're sort of um, working against. Each piece has one partner, right? So there's as many uh, orange pieces floating this way as there are floating that way, right? So they can each have a partner. Um, and once met, those partners disintegrate. Um, so at the end of each level, the play space becomes pristine and empty. And I'll come back to this idea of emptiness in, in a minute. I think minimalism is really a core theme of this game. So um, another interesting design choice is that you can actually draw your paths wherever you like along the strings. So you can draw them very close to the current uh, or very far away from the current. It's an interesting choice to me because it leaves a window for either very direct action or indirect action, right? So you can... Um, uh, draw and then wait for the action to occur, or you can almost flip the pieces, right? If you if you select them um, and draw current, uh, draw paths from right from where the current is. In fact, um, <laughs> when I started playing, and I think this comes because most games are direct action games, I didn't realize that I could draw paths. Um, far away, and I was flicking them across the screen like little paper footballs, right? And I thought this was super fun. Um, uh, it isn't the most strategic way to play the game, so uh, after a while it became evident to me that I, there was something else that I needed to figure out, and I stopped being so stick-oriented. Um, but I did really enjoy that, that feeling, and um, uh, so I think it's nice that you have that choice. So, one other thing you can do is that you don't have to deal with the front of the line of currents alone. You can also pull currents out of the back of the line. So if you can recognize a pattern, you can um, actually pull something out and then a whole, uh, <clears throat> uh, basically a whole line of currents will uh, sort of slam together at once which is super satisfying. And again, you get no extra points for that. But you get this sense of being really clever, right? You get this sense of having seen something um, and in the in sort of visual design. And um, in, in a way, that's, that's sort of um, reward enough, right? Uh, so in terms of skills that you're using when you're playing this game, it really is pattern recognition. And it's very reactive. Unless you plan on memorizing the levels. And from what I can tell, you can actually memorize. Uh, at least some of these levels are very close. Because I was able to do the same set of like X's. Um, yeah. And, um, uh, yeah. That's, that's interesting because they are um, the actual color generation is random, but there are some X for some of the levels. And so I think like specifically the level that we're seeing right now is the three levels have sort of this very clear tactic. And maybe that's what I was reacting to. There was, there's, a, there's a sense where you start, you can go, okay, I need to do this, this, you know, here, and that's going to happen. Yeah. And if you play it at a time, you, you, you sense in your, your own pattern in your, in your, um, your actions. Right? Um, so, um, in, in that respect, to me anyways, the game became akin to a kind of mental um, exercise routine. Right, so I, I, I got it down, and um, uh, that was kind of nice, right? Um, so early on, there are uh, only a few strings on each level, as you can see, and a couple of colors, and uh, pieces move at a fairly laggardly pace, plodding along like some kind of intricate, uh, I was thinking of like square dancers, or those kind of dancers in Shakespearean dramas you always see. 
Uh, and even though it's a puzzle, it's, it's fairly simple, and the difficulty comes really from uh, the number of strings involved and the variety of colors. And now here's the fail state. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to go back and try again. Um, uh, so you can see actually that grows. So the number of strings involved, the variety of colors, and how quickly the turns are moving. And uh, like most visual puzzles, the play field represents itself how close or how far you are uh, from solving the level. Um, and though, uh, so both the meters mentioned before and the sort of variety of colors um, uh, also give you a clue. Uh, but distance, I would say messiness and visibility, all are the main enemies in this game. And as they become defeated, there's almost a positive reinforcement cycle that makes uh, for an interesting arc to each level. And after the danger has passed, um, we're sometimes left with a kind of a cleanup period. It's almost like a, a quiet sweeping up um, at the end of the performance. And as the levels progress, as you see, I'm starting to fail. Um, there are more and more strings, more and more colors. The pieces are closer together on the strings, and they're moving more rapidly towards each other. So my first reaction as a player is I just have to get better at this. I just get faster. Um, and you can see that's what I was trying to do. Um, uh, but up at about level five, um, which is where I failed before, uh, uh, things change. And the game ratchets up, well, ratchets like up in speed and difficulty without a lot of warning, really. Um, you think you're playing this calmly little puzzle game, you're moving things around like some like ancient money under on the app. And, um, seriously, I was actually playing television during the, the, the early levels. And I could do both and equally you know, have attention on either. Um, but then I reached the land of level five, um, and there's a mountain in this land, and I call that mountain what the fuck. I named it because I got stuck there actually for quite some time, and I almost built a colony on that mountain. Um, so the land of the land of what the fuck made me go back. And um, and um, I couldn't really just pass it by getting better and faster, right? Um, so uh, what I realized at a certain point in just playing with the strings is that you could, you could hold them down. You can see that's what I'm starting to do on these levels. Is that I'm actually holding the, uh, some of the strings, and almost like a sustained note when you're playing a string instrument. Um, you, can, you can hold it and you can stop the, the uh, uh, strings from permits from, from moving, right? Um, so uh, I asked Zach about this, actually. Is this a fair way to play? Because it felt like cheating, right? I was like, oh, I'm cheating. <laughs> but, I've never seen any of video of something like this <laughs> Well, you want to respond to it? Because I feel like it's cheating. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> but it's still no, in there. I mean, I think like, I, well, maybe I'll respond to it at the end, because I think I have a couple. Yeah, so um, I didn't actually videotape the whole game, um, mostly because it's kind of hard to play with um, the video camera between your face and, and, and the game. <laughs> um, it was the best way that I could think of, of getting at it. Um, so uh, there actually the section after this, the stars, which I which I didn't tape, um, is the final section of the game, and I'm not gonna show it, so I won't spoil it much, but. Uh, any ideas you had about meditation really sort of disappear uh, during the stars section of the game. Um, it, it, it's a whole new universe really of what the fuck. And um, uh, one of the levels uses shades of gray instead of the colors that you've been so used to. And I personally must have some um, eye difference than yours because I can't see the difference between two of the shades of gray. And um, so I literally have to do trial and error on them, uh, which I think is sort of fascinating though because you, because it is clearly there and I should have someone else and they could see it, but I didn't see the difference, which was just weird. I thought I had pretty good visual acuity. Um, so uh, back to strategies. So uh, early on when I was just messing around, um, uh, I also realized uh, that you could do something which I call the cast. Um, which is a lot like in backgammon, you know, you've passed, you've passed each other and you're just playing it out, right? 
And you can do that here too. You can just essentially throw all of the, um, you know, leftward moving pieces and, like on the one string and the right, uh, you know, moving pieces on the other strings and essentially create a past game that you can then sort out um, uh, at your own measure, really. Um, so again, maybe you can respond at the end about uh, uh, whether you meant that or not. Uh, and it's one of those things where I felt, again, like I was cheating, and yet I was responding to how the game had um, come so fast and had so many things really So um, I, I did mention, I, all right, maybe I didn't mention yet. I actually didn't finish this game. I've been up to Star 7, I think it's Star 7, and uh, uh, which I didn't, I didn't but um, I, I think I will complete it after after EK um, because it it is definitely as simple as it is a very challenging task uh, to, to try to do. So I'm I'm some folk art. Um, so there are two other modes which I don't have a lot of time uh, to, to talk about. Uh, the two modes are aggression and harmony. These are endless modes, right? Um, and I have just a, actually a little bit of harmony, which I can sort of fast forward to. Um, wow, when that music goes away, it really just all the calmness goes away. Um, so, what's interesting about a harmony is. about harmony is it's tuned to let you, it's really tuned to let you play forever. I mean, unless you start messing around like, like I'm going to do here, um, it's really tuned to be, to not be that challenging, to um, essentially be something you could almost just do while you watch television. You, just, you could literally just sit there and do it and feel like, oh, I'm, I'm checking off these endless tasks off a list that gives me no pressure. Yeah. And that's a happy thing, you know. Um, but it also gives you the opportunity to play with it as a musical toy, which just to come back to is, is another really satisfying part of the, the design. Um, and I like to make these, I like to actually just fill the screen with these random paths and see what happens, right? <laughs> just, uh, just mess up and see if actually uh, the, the currents will meet or if it will create um, good or bad situations. Just kind of uh, it takes the watch they'll just Oh no, it's bad. Do I have to save it? No, save it so <laughs> uh, but anyway, so harmony is literally tuned to be something that um, is almost like a meditation tool, I think. And uh, the tone of it invites this kind of doodling and uh, playfulness, which is really interesting. I think uh, all together, and I'd love to, to hear um, from Zach what he thinks of some of the, the, the cheating strategies and things I've talked about. Uh, but, but in my mind, what this game does ultimately is it draws together the elements of a toy, a game, and I think a kind of minimalist visual poetry uh, that makes it not only fun and playful, but a rare contemplation of harmony and dissonance. So play it. I have this sort of like, I make these very, very hard games 
um, I think aside from this, and they always start very easy and then they get very hard, and I don't know if that's a particularly like smart thing to do maybe, but I think um, what it was trying to do, uh, which I don't think it does actually, and maybe this is sort of one of the failures of the game, is that it, um, we were trying to get to the point where like, if you do break through, it becomes meditative again. Because right. it's forced, like, it's total chaos, and you're trying to be comfortable um, and be calm, and if you freak out, you'll lose. But if you can stay calm through the hardest possible thing, it's just unbelievably, like, awesome. I but think it's, it really does do that. I, I guess it's just, like, I think, like, eight people have beaten the game. <laughs> 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 One of which is here. <laughs> Sorry, I really? nice. Yeah, which I'm super <laughs> impressed. Um, and, like, eight people, including me. <laughs> seven people. <laughs> um, uh, but I, I. But the other thing I think I would say is that, like, I guess I talked about this a little bit at the form and code thing. If anyone was there, but like the real structure of this game, it was all built sort of to intertwine um, the system and the sound and the mechanic and everything. And I think that designing like that kind of paid off in this respect, which is that if you didn't play the game the way I was expecting, but it's still was interesting, and, and maybe it felt like cheating, but it also kind of felt like you were manipulating this thing, and I think that, like, that is sort of what I wanted. I wanted to have kind of an open system that, that could be interacted with in any number of ways, even if maybe one of those ways was a little bit better for getting through the game. And the discovery of the cheating options actually came out of playing with the musical toy parts components oh, oh. of it, right? Because, because holding the strings down was a natural idea, um, that came out of the fact that this was, you know, like a harp and had strings, and oh, you do that when you play, you know. Yeah. So, um, so then I wasn't sure. It feels cheaty, but is it? Yeah. <laughs> no, I think it's great, and and actually, I think that it was actually really interesting to watch, like visually. I think it was really beautiful to see someone play like that. Like it was sort of this other system that was laid on top. But I mean, I don't know. It's my own game. So, <laughs> and watching anyone play it is kind of beautiful and fun. Oh. Um, and, I, and I, the other thing that I just wanted to address really quickly was sort of how you were saying that like the metaphor kind of melted away and like that was you know there was a story to it but it didn't really matter um, and I think that was that was really intentional and it, it was part of why why I picked that metaphor because um, the Halcyon is you know it's a story but it's also a metaphor that was made up for some other system and that this game was really you know it was about that and it had these elements but it's a game about a metaphor which kind of makes it a game about whatever you want it to be yeah that's a great point actually yeah and uh, for me it just the activity itself suggested other metaphors that um, were helping me to become better and especially the abacus uh, idea for some reason um, uh, because it was about sorting things, um, was helping me to become better at playing. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a game about being calm. And, yes, um, to be calm. it's definitely a game for OCD people, right? <laughs> Essentially, it's a game about putting everything back in its place. Yeah. <laughs> and then it will disappear from your life. In this sort of beautiful way. <laughs> oh, man. All right, well, I don't want to take up too much of Doug's time with this awesome game. Yeah. Unless, I don't know. All right, let's, let's, uh, I think I still have to download Nick's presentation, so give us. We'll say, okay, Nick Fortuno, um, talking about his play experience. Wow. Tracy, this is like the most awesome, like localized view of PowerPoint I've ever seen in my life. You have no idea. I've got like a timer and like can see both slides. It's like so. No, I've never seen. I've never seen this before. It's so rad. You learn something every day. Um, so, uh, 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 so I, I, I'm sort of um, a little bit infamous in the in the New York game scene for uh, disliking button, and I think that. Um, I think that there are people in the New York community who are kind of here to, to hear me to hear me like 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 rant about that. And I'm not going to uh, uh, <laughs> because in fact uh, uh, I you know the, the kind of reverse quote Julius Caesar. I I am not here to bury Doug but to praise him um, because I think Joust is one of the best um, public games I've seen in in years, and I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, and in particular, what I want to talk about is the way that it is uh, ritual, and the way that games are rituals, and the way that effective design of games as rituals can be like a really powerful tool. And I think what makes Joust uh, such an amazing game is the fact that it uses ritual technique 
to create play behavior and emotion in, in a very tight, clean, and, and effectively uh, quite safe way for a game that's actually about physical confrontation. Um, so, so I had a video of Joust, which is on my machine, uh, and not going to get here. Can I ask how many people saw Joust? Well, that's right. Oh, everybody. All right, rock. <laughs> so, uh, so I'll just describe Joust from the photo above. I have more photos of it. Um, the, the, the gameplay of JS Joust is that every player has a move controller that they activate at the beginning of the game, which causes its, its light to shine um, in, by the way, what I think is the best use of a move controller to date. Um, uh, once the controller is active, there's a countdown to, or effectively a countdown to start the game, and when the game starts, um, the, the accelerometers in the controllers are timed to music that's being played, either through either computer-moderated with a speed or a human-moderated speed uh, in the case of live music. And the accelerometer will permit a certain amount of movement uh, before it de deactivates the controller, which it does by causing first the controller to flash and vibrate and then to turn red. So if the controller is ever moving faster than the, than the music permits, that controller is eliminated, and the goal of the game is to be the last person with an active controller in the field, or in a team version of the game, to be, you know, the last members, the last team available in the field. But, okay, cool. Um, and that's that's basically the, the game rules in a nutshell. And, and I think part of the design of this game, and I think part of the design of games like this that makes them effective, is that that there isn't a lot of other layering on top of that. That it actually leaves it very open to you what to do, um, and that that has interesting effects. But I think that. One of the things to think about here is, is the nature of, of street games in general, and that when you, when you make games in public, you sort of you sort of tromp into the space of ritual. And this is something that's not really new. Um, Homo Ludens talks about this quite specifically and looks at it as a sort of universal thing. Like the term we use in game design, magic circle, is not isolated to games by any stretch of the imagination. And just to read the quote, just as there is no formal difference between play and ritual, so the consecrated uh, cannot be formally distinguished from the playground. The arena, the card table, the magic circle, the temple, the stage, the screen, the tennis court, the court of justice, etc., are all in form and function playgrounds, i.e. forbidden sports, included hedge, hedge round, hollow, which, within which special rules obtain. All are temporary worlds within the ordinary world dedicated to the performance of an active part. Right? And, and insofar as, as, as street games sort of participate in that way, I think they have a similar kind of features, and when they're designed well, they express those features. And this is, again, you know, like, the, and this is a historic thing. It's not just like anything new. Mesoamerican wall games were effectively rituals. They were used for various religious purposes, depending on what culture was practicing the game. But they all were sports and games and rituals and, and spectacles at the same time. And similarly, the Olympics uh, went through a series of sort of re religious purposes, from an ancestor worship to a Zeus worship. But through that whole period, it was both an activity that was fun, but also an activity of, of ritual importance. And that has certain characteristics to it that I think are critical to what rituals do. Um, they take place in specialized areas. Um, we, we somehow isolate an area either intentionally or, or, immersive, or just sort of emergently. We create an area in which the game exists and which doesn't exist. Um, that's part of what we mean when we talk about a magic circle, although it's a broader understanding of that. It's also initiated in time, right? Like, like there's something that introduces the game's beginning and then, and then closes the game when it's finished. And we have an understanding that we enter into the game space and then we leave the game space. And I think the Beijing Olympics have like one of the most dramatic presentations of that possible, which also includes a concept of music, which is, which is consistently important cross-culturally in rituals and also important in jazz. Um, and then they ask us to basically perform strange uh, and now we have no sound. Wait, um, this one's working. Okay. That works. Okay. Uh, and then they and they ask us to perform acts that just don't that don't make sense or inappropriate or are um, or are transgressive in typical culture, right? And so they they can do this through physical restriction, they can do this through prescribed rules, they can do this through sort of social mores that the game per, the game the ritual creates. And that causes us to act in weird ways and, and sort of enter a different space. And that has positive and negative ramifications. Um, but all of this is sort of like part of part of what it means to enter into a game space and just to kind of to drag the obvious theory into this, it's the it's the movement from the sort of profane world to a sacred world where different rules apply, where transgression is possible, where certain degrees of transgression create uh, impact and emotion that makes those spaces special in the first place. And I think that's what games do, and that's what ritual does. So there's really no differentiation at all, and it becomes the most obvious in this sort of street game play behavior. So when I analyze 
JS Jobs. When I look at JS Jobs as a game, I, I find that all of these elements are there, and that those elements are what make a lot of what make the game effective. To begin with, it has an opening, a very clear opening, um, which is the moment when you you turn on your controller, right? And and that and every performance I've seen several performances of Jobs now, and it's not always the same um, introduction, but the, in terms of what people do, but it's always a moment where people exhibit their introduction to Joust. They turn on the controller and they hold it up, or they turn on the controller and they hold it out, or they turn on the controller and they face each other. And there's an understanding that we're sort of, we're sort of waiting for everybody to be ready to start, which the system reinforces, but it's also socially reinforced by the behavior of everyone, and I think augmented by the fact that something lights up right in front of you, and lights up a bright, bright powerful color. Um, it creates conditions of, um, of limited behavior that force you into new positions. And I think, I love, love, love this picture because this is, I, I don't know if you, if you find this too, but this is like the pose of jazz to me. Uh, can I just give a, so that's Ricky Haggett, the developer of Ho-Ho-Cum, who's here. Um, this is us at the top of the Cologne Cathedral. Just, we were like, fuck it, the cathedral's epic. It's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is true, by the way. Um, so that, yeah, it's a good movie. Yeah, good ritual too. <laughs> But like that pose, right? Which is yeah, yeah. So to that, which which you know, to me, really, you know, we're almost fencing, right? And it's emergent, and I don't know if it's emergent from, and I'd be really interested to find out if it's emergent from modeling or if we just find people just do it everywhere. But I I consistently see people moving into that physical posture when they play, where they keep the, you know, it's 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 you know, uh, dominant hand forward, recessive hand back with controller in a gallop pose, moving forward in a gallop pose, sort of cautiously. And that, that comes about from a really simple rule, which is like, you know, I want your controller to get hit. So that then re, that sort of redefines your whole body. Like making this object precious and important is redefine your entire posture towards that object. And that makes, you know, that, that makes you behave differently. Um, and then engages you in a, in a physical way, in an embodied way in a ritual, because you can't, you can't, act, you can't walk in, in JS Jowls the way you walk in the real world. If you do, you will be eliminated. So you instead have to embody this different form, and that kind of creates a play pattern in and of itself. Um, and of course, and I think most importantly, it allows transgressive behavior um, in, in that it lets you hit people. Um, and, and in fact, not just hit people, kick people, shove people, touch people generally, sneak up on people, right? Like all of these things that are, are generally not permissible become permissible in Joust because of the, the way the rules work. Um, and, and the fun of Joust is in that, in that jostling and counter jostling. I mean, it has, a, it has a kind of like playground shoving kind of fun. Um, now, and I think that that that, that 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 kind of spirit is, I think, what makes Joust fun. But I actually don't think that alone is what makes Joust amazing, because um, that's not something that you can. It's it's not hard to come to game designs where you can kind of create that kind of behavior. And we, you know, someone who who, who co-runs a, a, a festival of this stuff, we have seen a lot of games that sort of try to approach this kind of behavior. But there's a danger in all of this. It's a danger inherent to ritual. And I and I you know I think about it in terms of like possession, right? Like when you ask players to enter a sacred space in the real world, you create a possibility of danger, a very serious danger that they will lose control of themselves because they'll stop paying attention to things. And anybody who's been watching like the human versus zombie play in Culver City over the last few days has probably noticed like the poor human versus zombie organizers like chasing people out of the street over and over again. And like that's because like people playing human versus zombies are not thinking about the street. Like they've been conditioned to think about a goal set that just has them avoiding zombies or chasing humans. And if they're not thinking about cars, they might not think about cars with all the ramifications that that has, right? And, I, and that's, that's metaphorized to me the best in, in the Bacchae with um, the death of Pentheus. If, you know, if you're familiar with the play, Dionysus basically gets pissed off at this king. And so he takes his drunk orgiastic followers and gets them convinced that Pentheus is an animal and they rip him to pieces in celebration of, of their god. And I think that, that, that metaphor is just really strong to street games and the potential that street games have. Like that if you're not careful about how you do this, you can lead people to go running into the streets or potentially rending something. And it's, it's, not, it's not accidental. It's like it's very possible within that space. Um, but this is where I think Joust becomes brilliant. This is the, 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 the move that I think moves Joust from just a really solid game that's fun and, and powerful to a game that's very successful and in a, in a strange way safe. And that is that you have a controller too. And the controller that you have um, is as sensitive to the music as everyone else's controller. 
So typically, and certainly I did, because I sucked at Joust the first few times I played it, it is very easy to just eliminate yourself by moving too quickly. Um, and, and while I might argue, you know, from a design perspective that it was meant to be for a more casual play pattern, you might be more forgiving about that, I think that what it, what it accomplishes is it, it teaches you very quickly that like, a, like rapid aggressive movement is dangerous and you need to be careful about it. But it's dangerous for a purely in-game reason. It's dangerous because it will eliminate you. So you don't do it. You instead be cautious and careful and you time your moves and you make your moves carefully to not use your whole body to be in a straight way safe for yourself, which leads to a kind of safety uh, among the play field in general. And so for a game that's really about shoving and kicking and hitting, it actually, it actually sustains very little violence relative to other games about punching and kicking and hitting. Um, and I think that's brilliant, right? Because it's, it's very elegant, it's very simple, and it's built into the ritual itself. That by creating a very simple set of transgressive conditions that allows everyone to participate, um, it also creates a, 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 a safe place, which, which the title would argue too is necessary. That the, tra the transgressive space can't be anarchic. It has to have some kind of structure to make the transgression safe. And I think that that, that, that one rule that runs through the whole system, you know, creates both the emotional space and the safe space for the emotion to exist. And that's beautiful. So just like we, you know, we, uh, we think about like the Olympics, and, and the, the Olympics is this entering into, into a ritual space in which we're going to compete and, and you know, like contest and feel these very strong emotions that can be released at the end of the experience. I think that in a smaller way, but in an equally powerful way, for average players, Joust gives people access to, to a ritual of play that allows them to express those emotions in that competition and then safely return back to the profane world. And for that, I think it's a brilliant design. Yeah, no, just like that. Thank you so much. It's amazing to sit here and hear someone analyze in, in depth. So yeah, no, big thanks uh, to them. <laughs> so could you talk a little bit about you know how that how that sort of central rule condition came about and, and you want, about the history of the game? Yeah. Okay. I'll give you the history of the game, and then I mean we were discussing actually this yesterday, like a pre-discussion, and I think. Yeah, on some points we like super, super strongly agree with us, and I think on some points there are like subtle differences, but pr pr productive uh, differences, right? Okay, so how did this come about? I guess we've been interested in like face-to-face, -face, we're calling games, like video games, for, like, okay, there's, there's no video, but face-to-face -face digital games for a while, um, and like we had done this stupid Wiimote game, Dark Room Sex Game, a few years ago, which was like, whoa, this is like, really fun having um, a Wii mode in your hand, but looking at each other, like that feels really weird because you feel like you should be playing a Wii game, but you're like looking at somebody, and that cognitive dissonance or something was was really fun. Um, so anyway, we've been uh, kind of exploring that idea somewhat less successfully. Like what you don't see when you're playing Joust is like a lot of the fail <laughs> prototypes, right? I and mean, I could talk about that endlessly. Um, this was done as a Wii mode version originally at the Nordic Game Jam, um, and. Kind of actually inspired by Button, I wanted to make a racing game um, where. And, and has anyone played Wii Party? Um, Wii Party is like the most e experimental, intele in intellectually interesting game to me, like the last ten years. And like everyone writes it off, but I love that game. And there's this crazy game that's called Animal Tracker. Uh, anyway, you should like look it up. I want for you. Um, so the, the idea based on this kind of animal tracker game from from Wii Party was that you would race across the room to a fourth controller or like whatever, like a control and all the other players. And it'd be super sensitive, so you'd have to like like walk really slowly, and you'd be tempted to move faster because you're in a race and then you move too faster. So like inevitably, like testing the sensitivity of my algorithm on the accelerometer, uh, with, me, with me and Nils were sitting in this room, so we'd constantly be like walking around the room in slow motion, just testing like my like values of the sensitivity of Wemo. We kind of constantly keep just pushing each other, uh, you know, because that's what we do, right? We play button and all these other five <laughs> games, like that's, we like pushing each other or whatever. Um, and then we were like, oh, okay, like the game we actually want to make is a more like facing each other, um, yeah, kind of like circle of death, like let's let's jazz this or something. Um, and then I think the other the other piece of the puzzle here, like you were talking about, 
it seems like when people play it, they do get into that, that like body stance. Uh, and I think the music is really key. Like the, the title is like, really intentional, and the music is J.S. Bach's Brandenburg Concerto. I'm, I'm a huge Bach fan, actually. Um, uh, like that, that Baroque, right? We have all these like bullshit um, Baroque like uh, stereotypes of like what it means to be a noble gentleman in the 1700s or whatever. And I think that that cultural key is really important to getting people to act like that, right? If like we were playing Shakira or something as the music, like I think it would be different, right? Um, so I guess that's like the history. Of it. Cool. And um, and so when you um. So, so what was the move to the move? Um, so this is pretty interesting, actually. Um, I, the, uh, I had been interested in the move for a while, and uh, my whole rant that I've been giving people is that I think it's really sad that people dismiss the move as like, like a more expensive Wemo. Like to me, that colored light changes absolutely fucking everything because it's it means that you can do these non-screen based games a lot easier because you have a giant pixel. So I, I, I don't know, if, if you're not familiar with the move controller, that's, you can set an arbitrary RGB, right, and the brightness of that um, in code, right? Um, and so that's huge, because suddenly just that little bit of visual information um, allows you to signal, like, are you dead, like a warning, or uh, what team you're on, all sorts of stuff, right? Um, but, like, I wasn't able to really get it working. We didn't have, uh, my studio didn't have a PS3 dev kit, so it was like, oh, well, maybe someday, I don't know. So I've kind of written it off. Uh, but the Wiimote libraries we used were really janky, and this was really frustrating to me because we could never like send the game to anybody else. Um, and a few people had asked to show it, um, you know, because I had to try the game in Copenhagen, and I was just like, so, and I think this is where like the indie community actually almost like saved this game to a certain extent. I was like so, was so desperate just to like have a, um, build that I could share that I absolutely killed myself and finally found some guy's C code for like a Bluetooth library and by some miracle got some OS 10. So I have, it's actually open sourced my um, uh, C sharp interface for using the move controller uh, and you can talk to me after if you're interested. Um, but yeah, so I finally got this uh, interface to working. And then from there, it's just been like move development all summer. Uh, but yeah, it was that kind of like desperation of wanting to show it to your peers that like forced you to to take that extra step in. <laughs> can, you, can you talk a little bit more about the failed experimentation? Like what, what you tried that didn't work? Um, man, this is a long story. I gave a quick, quick talk about this at Tigra. Um, we were working on some wizard dueling game, and uh, a lot of people have had this idea. It's a really obvious idea. Um, I, I don't think anyone's done it well for like, a lot of reasons that we kind of found out the hard way. But uh, it was supposed to be a Wiimote game. You know, there's always this like moment at the end of a Harry Potter film where like Voldemort and Harry Potter are looking at each other and there's like fucking colored lightning or whatever and like one lightning like pushes back or forth and then one ninja or whatever, right? Like we wanted to do that in a game where you would look at each other. Um, and man, we spent like a year, and then we made progress, but we never like quite got there. And in fact, I kind of wonder like if we were using the move at the time, would we have succeeded? I don't know. Um, but we got to this weird space where it's like, Humans are really bad with like just sound or rumble information. Like it was really, really limited what you what you can do, and we we wanted to make some sort of like complex Street Fighter type fighting system, right? And so to kind of convey that really like system centric view on game design with like face to face uh, play, especially with no visuals on the Wii mode, right? It was like pretty much impossible. So then we started adding in graphics so that the players could like check click how they were doing, but then it was really awkward because you like kind of wanted to look at your opponent and you kind of wanted to look at the screen and then it like just all went south from there. Um, there's a lot of other like lessons and details I could, I could say, but like, you know, pretty much I think the problem was we were still picking like game designers with like a, and this is kind of my whole rant in both my research and my game design on like system centric game thinking, which I don't think is as appropriate to do street games. So I think the lesson was like, oh, okay, actually what we want is really, really simple, short, like, I don't want to say mini games, but just really simple, almost folk games. So like, rather than thinking of Street Fighter 2 as our inspiration, thinking of, like this, the uh, Johan Sebastian Joust is based on a number of um, Danish or local folk games that we play. Um, and so I think once I, uh, started doing more research into folk games and making that at the center of my thinking, like that's, that's where it all kind of changed. So 
I think if I was to go back and do, like, let's say that wizard dueling game, instead of thinking about like one really deep, complex system, um, I would just do a number of short, small games like like jazz. So I think that's what's more appropriate to that moment. Also, right, it's like a big audience thing. So when we were playing this wizard game, people would just be looking and be like, "What the hell is going on?" Right? Because they had no idea what was going. On. When you see jazz, I think. Mostly, you can kind of intuit what's going on, and that's like super important, right? From like an audience perspective. So I just have one more question I want to ask. So I, I mean, you know, I draw. I, I, what, what interests me a lot is the way that there is kind of emergent social behavior in the game that becomes sort of ritualized as people play it more than once. Do you find that something that's been consistent in different plays in different places with different cultures, or is it is it sort of like a unique development each time the game is run? Like. Do I see the same behaviors repeating, or just any behaviors? It, it, do you see like the same basic set of behaviors? Or where are the differences? There's certain, certainly variations. Like my um, uh, Bernie, who's uh, the other developer that, that we hang out with, um, or did hang out with back in Denmark, started like, in fact, I'm just gonna demo. Like he would do this like stupid baroque bow for like really like deep bow, and like so like it became this thing that you had to like. Like you were a dick. It's kind of like saying like G L H F before like a Starcraft round or like G G F round. Like you're just an asshole if you don't like follow this custom. Um, so that was really fun. And you see like very like we were playing in Holland. And someone just said, "All right, winner has to wear the stupid pa uh, stupid paper hat." And like you know, I came back two hours later, and they were still passing around this paper hat to the winner. Um, so certainly, you, like you see, it hasn't been exactly the same, um, but um, for sure. Uh, although I will say again, I think it's. And this is maybe gets to what we maybe disagree about a little bit. Like I think maybe, like I wouldn't focus on the system itself too much. Like certainly you can you can play this game and it can really be a dud. Like you play it in a weird setting with people who aren't that into it and there's no audience around and they're not prepared or maybe it's like early in the morning. Like you you won't see those behaviors, right? And the game is just like oh ha ha it was uh, some sort of like keep it kind of still and then after around felt uh, like without control um, and it's really awkward to show it in a setting so i mean this is very much like it requires the right setting and player motivation and group of people right like just having that like circle that arena of people watching you suddenly changes everything right because you're suddenly like in some sort of like like the knife fight in dune or something right um, so I do think it's really what the players bring to it. So it's like I think you can only attribute so much to the system. Um, but I think that's that's as a designer that's that's like I mean that's also the point of the music, right? You're like you're trying to do all. You're almost like a, like a, a salesperson or something. You're trying to like sell people like you should be motivated. Um, and so the music is trying to like signal to the players that oh this is some sort of silly baroque game. You should act like some silly you know, project. So. Um, I guess it's this classic question of how much can you attribute to the human beings using the system and how much can you attribute to the system itself. Yes, and it's a tough question. Conversation for another time. <laughs> um, so, so, so Zach and Tracy, do you mind coming back up? Because I was asked by, 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 by Drew to make sure that the questions were more universal so we could, we could just do general questioning. So uh, I guess I'll just, I'll just say, so, so questions for anybody who spoke at all during this hour. Yeah. What is the most degenerate joust strategy you've ever seen? <laughs> well, like again, it depends on the players. So, like, right, the classic one that oh, like most assholes figure out really quick is like you can drop the controller and uh, then run and just hit its controller. And again, that's like that's either annoying or fun depending on who you're playing with, right? So, um, oftentimes it's like, haha, that's funny once, but the next time they do it, you start going, like, okay, like quit. If we actually want to play the game. Other times that actually becomes like an interesting tactic and maybe people are trying to wrestle that person down. So like again, I, I don't even I don't even think you can ask that question to a certain extent. Like it really depends on, on who you're playing with. Or like that's a, as at least uh, or like another example, right, the kicking. I mean I've seen the kicking be like a really fun strategy where we're really into it and it's just this kind of like high skill, risky move. I've seen other other Play communities where that goes really wrong. Like somebody gets kicked in the face, and then and then we have to make a rule on the fly that's like, all right, no fucking kicking, right? So again, I think this stuff 
really depends on who's playing. Are you, how physical do your players want to be? And that's thanks to me the strength of uh, what I would call like a deliberately low process intensity game, which is it's stuff is supposed to be deliberately tailorable by the players, right? Because the same set of exact cultural rules is is good for some groups of players and not other groups of players. So anyway. Um, now you talked about a lot about like the, the people buying the guru behaviors and yeah. like, just like that. Did you see a lot a lot of us were talking last night about the different music that you were doing with jazz. Did you notice any different behaviors coming out of the different design? I you know, like I I don't I think it was less broke last night. Um, I mean, I was like, I'm such a Steve Wright geek that I was like, fuck it, I'm gonna run this to music for 18 musicians, which aesthetically works really well, like based on the piece. But um, you know, to me, it's still the ultimate is to run with Bach. Like, like, I don't, I don't think that bow that Bernie did that I just showed would have ever happened if I had only started running the game with Steve Wright. Um, then again, you know, like it's like Steve Reich's music is really influenced by like West African drum music. So there's also, I think last night it had more of like that Dune feel with like the, the drumming or something. So that, that was cool. Like that's a slightly different coloration. Um, and I, I love doing that, but still, I, I would say for those Baroque associations, I would I would definitely go with Bach. Um, I mean, I'll probably open it up for people to play their own MP3s or something, but it's like my own preference was with the, the Bach. Super different on the screen, like how, how are they related? I think what I really admire about uh, Halcyon, like I really fucking love that game, um, and I think that's what's similar. What's going on here is I'm really interested in hybridity in games. Like I don't even see Joust as a game. It's like half game, half dance choreography, or like music performance, and it's that it's that thinking of like trying to blend different media and like being on the border of different traditions that that's what really excites me and so i think that's what halcyon really nails and i guess that's what you guys were talking about a little bit which is halcyon isn't just a game it's part like musical toy and like other stuff and so i that's what really excites me these days these uh I, again just to try to bridge these two sessions i mean you can say something but like this hybridity in games being on the border between different traditions that's awesome so. Oh, yeah. We one more question. Then we okay. Can stop. Yeah. Good. I don't want to waste your time with repeating this. <laughs> Does anyone have a question? It's not all waste your time. So. <laughs> Great. All right. Um, I mean, I think that, like, I, I, I actually, I think I identify with a lot of that, and I think that, you know, when I try and um, think about games and their context in relation to any other medium, the thing that always comes to mind is architecture. Um, because architecture is the only medium that I can really think of that kind of blends so many other disciplines together. And, and I think that it, both architecture and games sort of offer up this kind of ability to build a structure that can say any number of things and like in any number of fields and maybe it's the visual aesthetic or maybe it's the mechanics or maybe it's the way the building is built and how that influences how people use it. I mean, there are just so many things that you can do with this and I think Maybe what Doug and I are, are looking for is to sort of try and find the meaning of that.